But we're going to talk about tonight something that um, it's a very famous, very popular parable. Everybody say parable. We know what parables are. We know that Jesus used them to teach. And uh, this one tonight, the Good Samaritan, I went through a series with the students several weeks back and I just wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with the Lord about what to preach tonight and knew, knew about it for weeks now and um, just couldn't get clarity on something I think I was trying to push for tonight. And God just took me back to this, this sermon I preached a couple weeks ago about 2.30 today. So yeah, for like a week now, I've been, I've been going down this one road by this one passage and one thing I felt like the Lord was wanting to to bring tonight and he wouldn't give me freedom. So finally, I said, okay, God, whatever. I literally took my message in there and shred it, threw it in the garbage. That's okay. What do you want for the, student, for the people tonight? So here we are, the good Samaritan. I'd rather preach what he wants me to do. Wouldn't you rather hear what he wants you to hear? Amen. He will give me freedom to preach that later sometime. But um, parable, we know what a parable is. We know that Jesus used them. The actual word means to come alongside, okay? Um, it's it, to come alongside a story or, or, or a comparison that is that is put alongside something that, that Jesus wanted to teach a little better. And he used these illustrations, these parables to drive it home, okay? Um, someone give me an example of a parable you know in the Bible. Come on, tell me. What? Good shepherd. What else? Parable of what? The talents. Thank you. What else? Good Samaritan, okay? What else? The what? The tenants, the, the, the weeds, the, the wheat and tear. Yes, these are all things that we know. We've heard these things over and over and over again. But tonight, I hope tonight that you'll, you'll lean a little bit more than normal because you've heard this parable a thousand times, okay? We know the Good Samaritan. We've heard it, and you probably could, could, could teach a lesson on it, okay? But I just feel like the Lord, especially after what he's been doing in my life the last couple of weeks, wants me to encourage you to prove it. Let that sink in a little bit. Prove it. I mean, you can say all day long, I love Jesus, you can say that along. Oh, I love, you can sing the songs, raise your hands, blast in your car at home, wherever you are. You can worship Jesus. You can have a Bible study after Bible study after Bible study. But if you don't live out your faith, it's dead, right? It's time that we prove it. So I want to challenge you with those two words, prove it. Prove your love for Jesus. After watching that video, after hearing Trey's challenge, after singing those songs, I hope and pray that this, this will land on some more sensitive hearts and ears and, and lives tonight. So let's read this parable in Luke 10. Starting read, start reading in verse 25. Here we go. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, or he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, here's the story, you ready? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Everybody say compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. And then Jesus says, which of these three do you think proved, there it is, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he, the lawyer, said, well, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do. Everybody say do. Likewise. So first, let's quickly take a look at um, this lawyer real quick. Um, the lawyer, this lawyer was probably an educated man. Uh, he was most likely, he most likely had some money. Uh, he was well-dressed, well-respected by his peers and society, right? I mean, nothing with that is wrong, correct? Nothing that is sinful. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being well-educated and well-dressed and have some money in your pocket and be respected by everyone around you, right, Harville? <laughs> right? Love you, man. But it's true. I mean, honestly, we, there's nothing wrong with those things. There's a good attributes to have as men of God, as women of God. And, and um, however, this lawyer, like many of us and many of the 
Americans are Christians, we work to attain those things so fervently to get the education, to get that job, to get that promotion, to get that education, whatever, to look nice, dress, to get that uh, um, uh, reputation. But we do it to, at the sacrifice of doing what really, truly matters as children of God, to truly love God and to love people. So that was the issue with this lawyer. And Jesus knew that. So my question tonight, just kind of think about this. Did this lawyer truly love God? Well, for starters, let's look back at verse 25. And we, we see that this lawyer, literally, he stood up not to find the answer, but to, to test Jesus. He didn't really desire to know the answer to the question. He desired to test Jesus. He desired to, to, to show off. He, he didn't have a heart to love God and to love his neighbors. You see, this lawyer just had an intellectual understanding of what the Bible said about how we're supposed to love people and love, love God and love people. It was all about a head knowledge. Don't you think we have enough head knowledge in our church? Yeah, a bunch of head, strong, biblical. I know all about the Bible, but man, do we prove it? Do, do we do it? Y'all are a Sunday night crowd. So it's kind of, I'm, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but y'all are doing it, but can we, can we crank it up a notch? Absolutely, we all can. We, we need to prove it. We need to do it. And this lawyer had this head knowledge. We got enough of that. We, he needed heart understanding, okay? Uh, there was no proof of his love for God or for others, and Jesus knew it. And that's why in verse 28, uh, Jesus says, you know, you've answered correctly. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yep, that's true. But then he says, this do or do this and you will live. Uh, but see, the lawyer knew down deep he truly did not love God. And then he tried to justify or, or find a loophole for his actions, for his lifestyle. And, and, and hopefully he could get around this by asking that, who is my neighbor? To which Jesus proceeded to tell this amazing parable of the Good Samaritan. And I love the, the practicality of the application of this parable. I mean, right? I could, you could just leave right now and think and ponder on what this, this parable is and, and be blessed, right? And go, okay, I, I can live that out, but we're going to kind of um, get a little more detail here in just a second. So let's go. Let's look at this parable and see how the Good Samaritan's example of how to love God and how to love others was set before us, all right? So first we see the, the religious priest and the Levite. These are two people that had completely ignored. Now, again, again we know this parable is not true. It, it's a story, remember. It's to come alongside this lesson Jesus was teaching, but what Jesus was saying by, by saying this priest and this Levite, these were two people that by all means should have been loving people, right? Raise your hand if you're a Sunday school teacher or a deacon or a chair leader or a leader in this church, raise your hand. Raise your hand. If you're a leader of some so, sort of thing, okay? Y'all should know how to love people, right? And, and, but too often we don't, and that's what Jesus was bringing out, that, that too often uh, these, these religious people don't truly love God like they should, don't truly love people like they should. And Jesus wanted to point that out, that these two men were not in the position they should be to love people. So the priest and Levite saw this fellow, probably fellow Jew person. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say it, but we, I kind of think that it was a, a Jew. Uh, they saw him uh, and, and beaten, messed up, stripped half naked, left for dead, uh, and walked around him. So, ugh, uh, God, it's disgusting. Poor guy. Uh, walked on the other side, almost in a disgusted uh, mentality. That's sad, right? How unloving, how ungodly can that be? And was that? And do we not do the same in our lives? Listen, may we never look down on anybody unless we are looking down to help them up. I wish I could take credit for that, but I, I read it somewhere. I don't have the name, but no, may we never look down on anybody unless we are looking down only to help this person up. So, these, this priest and this Levite had turned a blind eye to this hurting man. And next, Jesus brings in this third man, a Samaritan. Everybody say Samaritan. Because back then, we know Samaritans weren't loved by Jews. They weren't like, they were considered half-breeds. They were half-Jew and half-Gentile or half-un-Jew. And, and they, you could say a lot of Jews were racist. They didn't like the Samaritans. So for Jesus to use a Samaritan as the good guy, it was almost like a smack in the face to uh, this lawyer. It had to be hard for him to understand and, and to, uh, to accept. But Jesus wanted this lawyer, and he wants us to see that, that this Samaritan proved, everybody say proved, his love for God by loving this traveler. You see, the Samaritan was on a journey himself, and he had to change his plans. By the way, sometimes um, showing God's love is inconvenient. Sometimes showing the love of God is requires a change of our schedule, a change of our plans, a change of, uh, of our bank accounts. Sometimes showing the love of God to people 
doesn't make logical sense, especially to lost people. But we're called to prove our love for God by loving others. And this Samaritan saw this traveler in bad shape and, and, and had what? What starts to see? Compassion. Thank you. He saw this traveler and he had compassion. Okay, this word compassion is a gut feeling. I, I used to have. I used to have the Hebrew or the, uh, the Greek word pronounced. It's like splagmai oitamu or something like that. But anyway, it's this gut-wrenching compassion. I know someone that's Larry or Doug, somebody clear me up on that. But he had this compassion, this gut feeling, this inner aching for this man who was hurting so bad. Couldn't we use a dose of that kind of gut-wrenching compassion for people? I know I do. I could use another shot in the arm every day of that, of this compassion that, that Jesus was trying to get across to this lawyer and to us. Um, he didn't walk by and say, oh, poor, pitiful guy, oh, like the other two did. He had compassion for him. And not only uh, did, he, did he see this man and have compassion on him, but he, but he took action. He could have said all day long, oh, poor guy, mm, that hurts that you're in that bad shape. But he didn't just have, he, he just didn't see him and have compassion. He took action. Everybody say, took action. And didn't have any excuses. He could have said, you know, all these excuses in the world. And are we not too often guilty of that ourselves uh, to find ways not to love people instead of loving people? I mean, maybe it's just me, but I really find myself saying, I got time for that. Or, or, or y'all know these people, they're on the side of the road or whatever. And you've seen that 2020 episodes. And you're like, oh, they're just, they're just, they're going to go jump in their Ferrari right after this. Right. And you're like, nah, that's not true. They're faking it. Those are the lies of the enemy. I mean, if God tells you to help somebody, have compassion on them, help them. Quit coming up with excuses and go after them and love them. Is that my phone? What is that noise? Oh, your Bible app. Man, come on now. You don't... <laughs> it's all good. I was like, am I missing something? Uh, you know, y'all know I'm ADD. Y'all can't mess with me like that. Man, I'll be chasing rabbits to, for another 30 minutes now. Notes. Why do you think I have my notes and highlighted and, and I've, I got to stay on track? Here we go. Um, see, it doesn't mess me up. Took action. That's right. He didn't make any excuses. And I, and I, was, I was saying maybe, maybe it's just me because y'all know I have issues and, and a lot of them. But I try to make excuses and the devil tries to, to get me off track and tries to, to say you ain't got time or they're lying or they're cheating or they're, it's all their fault. They deserve that or whatever. Uh, but listen, we have got to stop making excuses and, and, and show compassion, to take action and, and love people. So not only did this good Samaritan not make any excuses, he wasn't scared to get dirty. He was scared to get dirty. I mean, this, this cat was not scared. To, not only was he not scared to get dirty, but he got probably bloody. I mean, he had to, right? He says he, he nursed this man's wounds. Uh, he, took, he let go of his own comforts, his own conveniences. Uh, verse 34 of that chapter says, he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil, that was for the pain, and, and wine for to be disinfected. And then he set, on him, he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. Got his hands dirty. Got his hands bloody. He sacrificed his own uh, comfort and, and walked beside this animal and put this beaten, bloody man on his own animal so he could take care of him and take him to the inn. He also generously gave two days' salary um, to the innkeeper to take care of him, provide for him, provide food and nurturing. Um, and we're going to make another point in just a minute with that. But, but Jesus made the, this point that, that even he spent the night with this guy in the hotel. That's going ex to the extreme, right? That's going even further than, than uh, would be expected. But that's where we need to be as Christians, as believers, as followers of this Jesus has given us so much that we can give to others. So, the Samaritan showed the love of God to this total strange traveler. Now, so what does this mean for you and me? Ask me. I'm so, there you go. What does, I'll make sure you're all awake. How can we love others more? How can we love others more? Number one, here we go. If you're taking notes, write this down. It should be on the screen. See the hurt. Should be on the screen. There it is. Take action was a while back. See the hurt, number one. And ask God to open your eyes to it. I mean, guys, we're busy, busy creatures, are we not? We got a lot on our plate. We are constantly going. I'm telling you, I got three kids and I feel like I'm just constantly chasing my tail. Where's that, you know? And I, and I, don't, I don't take the time to relax like I should. I don't take the time to, to open my eyes to look for people that are in need, to see the hurting. 
And we need to make that a prayer and ask God to show us that. And, and it might or might not be as blatantly obvious as a man bleeding on the side of the road, half dead, right? But I promise you, if you're not asking God to show you those things, you're going to walk right by those kind of opportunities. Walk right by. Ask God to open your eyes to see the hurting. Secondly, have compassion. Say it. Have compassion. Ask God to give you that sploignaoitamu, whatever that we word, that, that, that gut-wrenching desire to help people, that gut-wrenching hurt for other people's hurts. Uh, regardless of who they are or what they've done to you or what color skin they got or, or wh- whatever, have compassion for those that are in need. Thirdly, we say, there it is, take action. Hey, there it is. Take action. Ask God to help you to be okay with getting dirty. Maybe get a little bloody. Whatever you need to do to, to take action and to get dirty. We, we, we say that along, oh, poor guy, look at the little guy. Oh, it's so terrible. She this, he that. But we must take action. What good is our faith if we don't act it out? Come on. But did anybody think of a verse when I said that? James, who said it? James chapter 2. Verse 15 through 17, look at it. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for, his, for their body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it, is not, if it does not have works, is dead. We must take action to prove it. Everybody say prove it. Prove it. Our love for God and love for people. We must be ready and willing to take action and possibly meaning getting dirty for the kingdom of God. And unlike this Good Samaritan, we also need to, number four, put other people's needs before our own. Sorry, that's a little long. I tried to shorten it, but I couldn't. Number four, put other people's needs before your own. Ask God to help you with this. Ask God to help you see those needs and to see other people's needs before your own. Um, I mean, I, I kind of, I mean, what more perfect example than Jesus who gave it all for us, put himself down. Um, um, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. John 15, 13, 14, Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Why is that so hard for us to put others before ourselves? Well, do you want to know what I think? You're going to hear it because I got the mic. I believe we're just a bunch of selfish pigs. I know I am. I'm selfish. And I, I say this periodically to the students all the time. I just want my way. I want things done my way. And, and it's awful. It's so ungodly. We, we, are, we should be held to higher standard. We should be putting other people's needs before our own. I mean, it starts from infancy. I want my toy, whatever. We, we whine. We, we're selfish. You might be like, I don't, I'm not selfish, huh? Oh, really? How about last time you went out to eat with your spouse and she wanted to go here and you went there, but you really wanted to go here because I want that food. I, want, I wanted that place to eat. Or, or how about in line at a, at a convenience store or a grocery store and that, you're in a hurry and you got to get somewhere and be here and do this. And the person in front of you is taking four years to check out. <laughs> and the cashier lady is like, well, how's your day? Beep. I'm so glad. Beef, like a three-toed sloth, chicken, you're out. And you're like, come on, man, I got to go. But maybe God's trying to say, hey, chill. Look around. Look for opportunities to pray for the people, to, to help people. Maybe God's calling you to pay for that slow person in front of you, that for their meal, whatever, for their, for whatever. We need to be putting other people's needs before our own. And shouldn't we, as, as followers of Jesus, be the last people to be selfish to be self-centered. I mean, come on. We got to be putting, we need to be putting other people's needs before our own um, and, and be different the way we treat people that are hurting. Um, just a little thing I was kind of contemplating a while ago. I was like, what if just for one week, we could, we could put other people's needs before our own? Just one, just to try, to try one week. You know, we did the fasting thing for how long? Like 20 something weeks. What if just one week? Sorry, what, no, the right days. That'd be like six months. Hey, maybe that's prophecy. Next January, we're going for six months. Who's in? Not it. Um, hey, hey, God calls you to do it for 23 weeks. We're going to do it, right, Doug? But <laughs> we like our food. We like our stuff. There we go again. I'm gone. Um, 
Oh, one week. If, if just for one solid week, until next Wednesday night, we, we, could, we could practice this, okay? To be selfless, to put other people before ourselves. What would our workplaces look like? Man, what would our schools look like? What would our, our families look like? If, and I'm just saying this because I have three very selfish children. And I, that's nothing new. To, I mean, I, they know that. And they got a very selfish mom and dad. What if just for one week, Misty, we put everybody else in our family's needs above our own? Uh, how, how could that change? How could that open our eyes to uh, a deeper level of understanding of God's love for us and for other people? Um, so number five. We got, uh, let's run through these real quick. See the hurting. Ask God to show you the hurting. Have compassion. Take action. Put other people's needs before your own. And fifthly, lastly, be generous. Everybody say, be generous. Be generous. Ask God to empower you to be generous, to give sacrificially, to go over and above, to, to go to that next level. You know, uh, Jesus says, and this is not my notes, but I'm going to probably mess this up. He says, someone asked for your tunic, give them your cloak. Run one mile, run two, right? Go extra, go further, give sacrificially, be generous. Uh, this is where this Samaritan went over and beyond. I mentioned it all ago. He could have just taken the guy to the hotel and paid for his dinner that night and took off. But no, he left two days salary and even promised to come back the next day if there's anything else. Went over and beyond uh, what he could have done and most people would have done. You know, I've been on the receiving end of some generosity before. And um, there's been times and uh, uh, perfect timing, guys, perfect timing. And from many of you in this room, uh, where God just encouraged you, empowered you, whatever, to be uh, to generous with something of me. Uh, I think back um, when, when Misty lost her father. How long has it been, baby? I was trying to think of that a while ago. It's been several years. But the point is, um, y'all loved on us. And y'all took care of us and gave us gas money and, and provided meals for us. That's what we needed. And we're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. But are we willing to go to that extreme for total strangers? People we don't know the situation is, just give until it hurts. Just take care of people and, and, and give and give and give. I, I've also been blessed to be able to, to be on the other side of generosity and help people. I'm telling you, man, it's, there's, there's just so much joy in giving and helping and serving and taking care of people. Why? Because that's what Jesus did for us. The generosity, the grace, and the mind-blowing mercy that he has given to us help us God, to be generous with what we've been given to give to other people. Be generous. So listen, what's the overriding lesson here, okay? We're done. Y'all can get out a little early tonight. What, what's, the, what's the overarching, overriding, uh, big, big picture lesson that Jesus wants us to understand from this parable? I believe with all my heart, those two words, if you get nothing else out of this, you can say all day long, you love Jesus and you're a Christian, but you've got to what? Prove it. And you can prove it in a bunch of different ways. But I, I, my challenge tonight, I, I want us to leave here tonight saying, okay, God, open my eyes. Help me see the, the need. Help me see the hurt. Give me compassion. I'll take action. I'll put up people's needs before my own and I'll be generous. Whatever you need me to do, I, I want to prove it, God. I want people to see that I love Jesus. All he's done for me, I want the world to know it. I ain't scared. Give me opportunities to prove my love for, for my father. And you know, as we read that, he says, do it. Jesus says, you know these things, do it. Prove it. Live it out. 1 John 4, 19 through 21, it says, we love what? Because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who, for he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Love others. You, they, well, that's talking about Christian brothers, yeah? But who's to say that beaten and bloody person won't become a child of God, won't become your brother or sister? Love them. Take care of them. Go over and above what the world would see as logical and take care of people. Love people. Prove your love for the Lord. So ask yourself this as you would close your eyes and bow your heads. I want you to ask yourself these couple questions. Does my life prove to the world around me that I'm in love with Jesus? Do, do people know that I am a child of God by the way I live my life, by the way I prove my love for Jesus? And, and I believe if you're like me in this room, you, 
mess up a lot and you have a lot of room for improvement. But just ask yourself this question, what needs to change, Father, for me to prove my love for you to others?